My name is Laura Flanders, and I couldn't be happier to be sitting here with, well, I mean, let's face it, we have very few people who are as, have the standing that Mary Robinson has to talk about connected leadership. And we are here, Laura Flanders show viewers and listeners, at a live event here at the Rockefeller Bellagio Center in Italy, where the topic has been connected leadership, and especially women's collected, connected leadership. So I want to start by pointing out that we tend to tell hero stories in the money media. I don't say mainstream media, because I don't believe they are so mainstream. But the all about money media loves a hero story with a beginning, middle, end, victory, defeat. What we've been discussing here this week is that history doesn't really move that way. And not even individuals are just plucked from the heavens to land on Earth and be our leaders. So not to disparage your leadership qualities, Mary, but for many of us, I think we first, because of the failings of our money media, became aware of you when you were president of Ireland. So we won't stick solely with the personal, but to begin there, can you give us a little bit of your back connected story? Did you just spring from the heavens as president? <laughs> well, not quite, but I did have a very early interest in human rights and gender and equality because I had four brothers, two of them older than me and two of them younger than me, squeezed in between. So I had to use my elbows and, you know, it was an early start. I spent a good deal of my time as a lawyer fighting for opening Irish society in so many ways with many others. And then um, I'd, I'd spent a year in the Harvard Law School. I'll, I'll tell you how old I am now, I have to confess. I'm the class of 1968. Grasp that. Good year, though. But think about it, that <laughs> year, that year. That was the year when most of my American contemporaries were complaining about an immoral war, the war in Vietnam. Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April. And just after I graduated, uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. But what I brought back to the Ireland of the time was a feeling, young people can do things. We can make a difference. And that was not what the Irish world was telling me, especially as a woman. When you think of those years and then being president, what are your accomplishments that stand out? What are the things you're particularly proud of? I'm not really good at that. You know, I'm genuinely not. I mean, that's, others can think about that. What I do know when I was elected president of Ireland, I was determined that I was going to walk tall as a woman. I was going to show that it was actually an advantage to be a woman taking this position and that all my knowledge and skills and empathy, everything I'd learned was going to make me do a better job mm. because I was a woman. And I you know, continued that, and I um, made a point. I, I had thanked the women of Ireland um, who elected me um, um, on the night of the election, and I, I used the expression, um, who instead of rocking the cradle, rocked the system. That's probably the most quoted quote <laughs> of my presidency, or, or maybe since. But I learned exactly what that meant years later, when I was based in New York with an organization with Peggy Clark called Realizing Rights. I was also doing a bit of talking in the US on human rights issues. And I was in Boise, Idaho, and it has a fair Irish population. So quite a turnout turned out to hear my speech to my kind of pleasure, slight surprise. And at the end of it, a young woman came up very purposefully and she sort of had her hand already out. So I came down from the podium to meet her on the level. And she said, I want to shake your hand. You are my first vote. And when I told my father, he nearly killed me. <laughs> and I never forget it. You know, oof, oof. <laughs> and that explains a lot of what happened. You know. Well, you're very humble to, to, to um, leave it to others to describe your legacy. We could spend many days doing that. Um, but I would say that the way that Irish women have been rocking the boat ever since mm. is not unconnected to your rocking job, um, which was rocking. Um, <laughs> for the publication purposes of your latest book, Climate Justice, we're reminded that you were UN <laughs> Special Envoy on Climate Change. But the last time I talked with you, Mary, was mm -hmm. whatever it was, maybe seven years ago, and so much has changed. The level of urgency around mm -hmm. climate change seems very different mm -hmm. today. How do we communicate, how do you communicate 
the sense of urgency. I mean, lives are at stake. Well, I've been lucky enough to be kind of involved at a, a level where I understood what was going on, if I could put it that way. Um, I was appointed uh, as a special envoy of the Secretary General on climate change, as you mentioned, um, the year before the Paris Climate Agreement. So I was working towards it, and Ban Ki-moon, in fairness, said to me, you know, do it the climate justice way. Yeah. Be involved with the small island states and the least developed countries, etc. So that was where I positioned myself. And I heard a lot of informal discussions between ministers leading up to Paris, and they were all boringly saying the same things. You could predict the lines. America was saying one thing, China was saying another thing, Africa was, you know, African countries were saying another. Everybody was predictable. Brazil, you knew what they were going to say. Mm -hmm. And the small island states were saying desperately, we need to have 1.5 degrees in the text. We need it desperately. And so we got this new goal, new articulation of how, we, how, how much warming we can endure. And it was stay well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial standards and, and work for 1.5 degrees. And I honestly thought at that time, that was for the small island states to you know, get a, give them a, they worked hard for this. But Paris had to ask the scientists, what does this mean? Because nobody had figured it out. That was the astonishing thing. No, no scientists had actually done their homework on this. Mm -hmm. So last October, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is about 1,000 scientists, but also with governments agreeing the text of what they produced, came out with this report, which was very stark, a wake-up call for the world. And it said, we have 12 years in which to change course, to get back to a safe world, to be on course for a safe world. And to do that, we have to reduce global carbon emissions by 45%. Last year, 2018, they went up. They're not being reduced. We're not, we're not on course for this. And that's why um, we really need to take this very personally. Um, I hope that we are waking up. And I actually believe that women's leadership is the most vital component of the movement we have to create. Why so? Because women's leadership is sharing. It's, it's, a, it's a leadership that uh, believes that everybody has to have their voice heard, that we need to think about the other, and the other is even outside the room, that we need a, a solidarity to achieve, etc. It, 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 you know, I, I've been very impressed over the years by the difference between a male hierarchical leadership and the more women's leadership. Now, there are some male leaders who are crossing over. I was going to say, is it, a, is it biologically yeah, determined? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but the truth is, this is the leadership we need. Can we make the kind of change you're talking about within our current political economic system? We can't do it with women leaders alone. We can't do it with personal change of habit alone. This is systemic. This is big. But women leaders can be a core lead because we need behavioral change. Who changes behavior in the family? Mm -hmm. Who who's close to communities that have the wisdom of the doing that we've disregarded so much? Women's leadership can't do it alone, needs helping. We love solutions these days that are win-win and everybody benefits. And if companies just follow the incentives of the market, they will do the right thing. Will they in this case? No, Is we have this to, a win-win situation? We have to take on the current market, so-called um, very unequal society that we have. We have to immediately abolish um, fossil fuel subsidies. We have to have a carbon tax that is fair. Look at Macron in Paris, um, in France. He had his one planet summit, but he removed a wealth tax and then he slapped on a carbon um, uh, increase with no regard for rural where people need to drive, Mutants. farmers, etc. No fairness. Um, we need to have a just transition for the workers in the coal, oil and gas fields. They must be part of the solution. We need um, to uh, really think about our habits of stupid consumption. I remember when Gary Mathai, when Gary Mathai had a big influence on me, she used to come to the UN when she got her Nobel Prize in particular, but even before, she would come to the UN <coughs> And she'd be given five minutes. Pfft, forget it. <laughs> she hadn't come to the UN for five minutes. After about 20 minutes, I'd rein her in <laughs> and say, Wangari. <laughs> and she was brilliant. She spoke, and, and her mantra was, um, reduce, reuse, recycle. We now know the danger of plastics. 
we know where, you know, our oceans are becoming acidic, but also our fish are becoming polluted. We know that we've lost species beyond belief. We have huge mm. problems. We have 11 years to get back on track. Mm. It is doable. That's what the science has told us. The only thing that we need to do is change the political will. Mm. I believe that women in particular, at a core of a movement, can articulate a way of doing. I mean, I grew up mending. I grew up, um, my, you know, children reused clothes, hand-me-down hand clothes. They were regular, sewing, darning. Um, uh, we didn't throw away everything. It wasn't an unhappy society. It wasn't, a, we weren't deprived. We actually, um, you know, that, that was a, a way of doing it. We need to go back to simpler ways of relating, and in particular, build the relationships. How do you do it? How do you connect and cultivate the, leaders, the leaders and the leadership um, that you so ably bring into the light and bring into attention through books and writings and what you say? And your, I should mention, and through your extraordinary <laughs> podcast, which we need to call out, Mothers, Mothers of Invention, of Invention <laughs> yes. where you also bring attention and voice, yeah. and, and not they have their own voice, yeah. but amplification. Yeah. To women I, all I over think the it's world. because I actually am still listening and learning, literally. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm really interested in what young people are doing. Um, I'm really impressed by um, you know, the savvy, and especially the savvy in uh, understanding patriarchy, not wanting to have any part of that. It's every, almost everybody we interview on our podcast, Mothers of Invention, uh, is talking about the same things in different parts of the world. It's fascinating. And I've learned a lot in the sense of uh, packing that in. We need to have the, the sort of opportunity that this terrible, stark challenge that the scientists have placed us with. We have 11 years to change course. My God, it can be a better world. It can be such a better world. Why don't we get on and do it? So you're preempting my last question, which is the last question I ask on my show pretty much every interview, and that is, what is the future story of now? What will be the story that the future tells about us in this moment? It's either or. And I'm going to be very um, clear about this. The future will be very damning if we don't use this time, because they won't have that time. This is what Greta Thunberg is saying. She's a 16-year-old now. She started at 15. It's unfair that she's had to do this. And she's saying, you know, she's saying to Davos, our house is burning and all you care about is money. It's the right language, it's the right voice, but she shouldn't have to do that. They will be very, very starkly critical. Or they will say, thank goodness. Thank goodness for that report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that made it so clear. And then that women's leadership stood up to the plate. That's what I want. I want to see women's leadership globally become connected in a way that we haven't. We have lots of women leaders, we have lots of um, networks, but we haven't done it. I want to see it. I really want to see it. Mary Robinson is the former president of Ireland and UN Special Envoy on Climate Change, as well as former High Commissioner on Human Rights at the United Nations. Her latest book is Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future. You can find her podcast, Mothers of Invention at any podcast server that you fancy. I want to thank you, Mary, so much for being with us on the show. <laughs>